This is the Athlete Mindset Podcast hosted by Lisa Bontesumi, and it's all about mental health in sports. This podcast is presented and produced by Sports Epreneur, part of the CAS Source Network. This podcast series is a space for conversations with athletes, coaches, practitioners, and stakeholders in sports. And it's where those individuals share their perspectives, experiences, and thoughts on mental health in sports. I am Eric Kazmov, the founder of CAS Source and the creator of Sports Epreneur. And we're hosting the Athlete Mindset Podcast on this platform as I deeply believe these conversations are essential and deserve to be prioritized. If you would like to be featured on this show or one of our many other shows, or if you are looking to create your own content, please reach out to us. You can find us at sportse.io, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Lisa Bontasumi is a psychotherapist and mental performance consultant to high-performing athletes at the youth, collegiate, and professional levels. She's the first ever mental health and performance coach for Oakland Roots SC, a men's professional soccer team in the USL. Lisa is the founder and CEO of Ath Mindset, and she's the host of this podcast, Athlete Mindset. So today on the Athlete Mindset Podcast, I have the honor and privilege of sharing space with Dr. Aaron Goodson. He is the Director of Mental Health and Performance at Duke University. Welcome, Dr. Goodson. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to, to have what I hope is a great conversation about a bunch of different things. Yeah. Health and performance. So For sure. A bunch of different things, for sure. No, we met last October at the Association for Applied Sports Psychology's annual conference, which was held in Fort Worth, Texas. So I'm excited to bring it full circle and be able to sit down with you one-on-one. Absolutely. And a lot has happened since then. So I know we'll get into some of that and looking forward to the next annual conference, which will be in Orlando in just a month from now, a little over a month from now. That's right. That's right. Yes. So tell me about your role. What do you do as the director of mental health and performance at Duke? So my role, there are a couple of things that come to mind when I when I explain to people what it looks like. One, mm-hmm. the role is fully embedded in the athletic department. And the reason I think it's significant and it's important to mention that is that when we think about the different ways to provide support for student athletes, collegiate student athletes, you don't have to use one particular pathway. So when I say that, I think about folks that do the mental health and performance work, and they may be in private practice and contracted Uh into Uh the athletic department, whether it be for the entire department or for a specific team or through the Department of Sports Medicine. I also think about individuals that work in a different entity on campus, maybe the counseling center, the university counseling center, and um, have a liaison that splits time or makes sure that their presence is, is known to visible in athletics. Then you have this model uh, of being embedded. And I think being embedded in athletics provides so much more information and so much more visibility to help normalize self-seeking uh-huh. among student athletes. So in my role, I, again, embedded in the athletic department, provide both clinical mental health counseling support and support performance psychology support to student athletes. Mm-hmm. At Duke, we are fortunate to have a staff of four, which is not always the case in places, but when you have staff members, you are able to assign a staff member to be a point person or a number of staff members to be point people for maybe your larger roster teams so that every team, student athletes, coaches, support staff know hey, this is our point person if we want to facilitate a referral for a student athlete, if we have concern about a student athlete, or if we you know, want to do some consultation about how we can best support in our roles, even though we're not the mental health or sport performance site provider. And so even though each team has a point person, student athletes are free to see whoever they want to see because the most important thing is that they feel like there's a good fit and build that therapeutic alliance with whoever they are in front of. Some student athletes feel that, you know, talking to a point person for their team, who they may see around at practices, who they may see at competitions, uh, feels a little bit too close. And not mm-hmm. that they don't trust that person, but that there is some benefit to talk to somebody that may have a fresher perspective mm-hmm. or a little bit more distance. And so I say all of that to come back to the initial question of, 
I am over that, right? And so in having two assistant directors that work alongside me, I'm managing that, I'm having conversations with coaches. If there are students of concerns with athletic trainers, academic support staff, with strength and conditioning coaches, you know, with the people that comprise what we call an interdisciplinary care team, in addition to providing those individual services as well as those team sessions. So my favorite quote is that there's no such thing as a typical day in college athletics. And being in the role of director, I think I definitely get to experience that, not only from some of the administrative and oversight management piece, but also getting to provide those services individually and in a group format as well. All I have to say is let's go after all that. I mean, I think there's so (laughs) much (laughs) that you just shared. And so I want to pull some salient points that I heard. I mean, there's probably some I'm going to miss for sure, but like want to highlight it. A piece about fully embedded, as you said, is unique, is not usual, is I believe it should be the path everybody takes, that it's embedded in part of what happens. I think that there's something special about Duke that is committed to that. Can you speak to that? Why would Duke do this? I mean, there are so many other universities and colleges throughout our nation that do maybe start with or try the consultants. Like that's what Ath Mindset is all about. We come in and make contracts with different universities and colleges who have not yet or don't know how or don't have the resources to have a fully embedded department like yours. What is it about Duke that allows that to happen? I think that it first, I think it, it shows the commitment that the athletic department has to the overall mental health and wellness of their student athletes. I think part of that is not only Duke athletic department culture, but also being a part of a larger system, a larger, well-known, world-renowned medical system, the medical campus, Mm -hmm. being in that footprint. Mm -hmm. um, There is kind of the expectation of why Mm -hmm. wouldn't we do it this way? Or why wouldn't Mm -hmm. we do it in a way that is considered to be among the best way to do it? And I think really kudos to the administration and thinking about my direct report, who's the assistant athletic director for student athlete wellness and Mm -hmm. oversees even my role as director of mental health and performance. You know, him coming in six years ago now, and I think starting this because it is something that exists at other institutions. And it became clear that if we really want to align with what we say about valuing ensuring our student athletes have access to support and what we feel like is the best way, Uh then let's Uh look into this. And so Uh my, Sean Zethlin is his name, my my direct report came to Duke and uh, from there has been able to help build to add one staff member turned to a staff member and a postdoc that turned into two staff members has now turned into three additional staff members. And so I think it says a lot from an institution standpoint, to make that decision to embed a mental health and wellness professional, whether it is a licensed psychologist, a licensed clinical mental health counselor, a licensed clinical social worker in the department, and also recognize that it is a little bit different when someone is embedded, Uh that there's a closeness there, that as we maintain our ethical codes and privacy and confidentiality, that we need to uphold and maintain, but we're in a system where information is shared so freely about athletes to really trust those people to do their job and to share what they can appropriately share Uh and that we're all here for the same reason, even though we're approaching it from different directions and from different disciplines. For sure, for sure. Um, And I think that's magical to be able to interdisciplinarily collaborate from your own areas of expertise to support the student athletes holistically, for sure. You've mentioned a couple times now. Go ahead, Dr. Goodson. Uh, I was just going to to add on the end to to kind of close the loop. But I think it really is a a testament to to Duke Athletics' commitment. Uh Uh And I think the pace in which the number of staff members have grown is one that is different than other places. And if you don't have the resources, finding the resources are getting creative. Yeah, I think it really does say a lot about the administration's stance on being able to support student-athlete mental health and wellness. Absolutely. And I think the value 
that they see in it. And then, I mean, for lack of a better word, putting your money where your mouth is. Duke yeah. is a private institution. It has more resources than some other universities, but they do have discretionary judgment about how that's used. And so to actually funnel it in this direction is really, really awesome. You brought it up a couple of times and it's a question I get asked all the time. What's the difference between someone who serves a student athlete from a clinical standpoint versus a sport performance standpoint? Yeah, that's an interesting question for me. I happen to to be duly trained to not only have the clinical mental health license, but also have the certified mental performance consultant credential. I think that the difference is, or the difference can be, the, the pathways that are taken to provide intervention based on the presented concern. Mm-hmm. I think when the, the presented concern, we talk about overall wellness, there are some things that can be addressed by a performance site clinician or a mental skills trainer, but may be better served or deeper served by a licensed mental health clinician, depending on the way that it's presented by the client and, you know, maybe what folks are listening for in their theoretical orientation and ultimately the level of functioning and the level of distress that the client is experiencing. Mm -hmm. I think there are things in those two realms specifically that really help strongly delineate whether a licensed mental health provider is more appropriate than a performance site consultant or sports site consultant. Uh, So I see that as the difference. I think one of the challenges, and I talk about this so often, is sometimes our clients, and I think especially collegiate student athletes, don't experience the delineation, Uh right? That it can change very quickly. Uh But coming to you with a performance concern or what starts out as a performance concern can very quickly Uh turn into hey, there's a clinical undertone here or a subclinical undertone here Mm -hmm. that is important to address in addition to the performance component. And in the same token, there can be really strong subclinical and clinical concerns that are impacting performance, but a performance intervention can can address the performance but may not necessarily fully address the the well-being and the functioning outside of sport or in addition to sport. And so I think that there is a line. The line is a bit blurry sometimes. I think especially the context in which your athletes are competing really helps or doesn't help, keeps that line blurry or really just speaks to how those things can change. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. depending on what the presented concern is, I think depending on your background and training and your scope of practice and your Mm -hmm. competency, that's Mm going to influence then what intervention you put forth for the client to be able to, to utilize and to try out. So I see that as the difference. I hope that wasn't too convoluted of an explanation, but that's where the line is. Well, let's break it down a little bit more. It wasn't convoluted, but let's break it down even more if there is a parent of a young athlete, maybe freshman or sophomore, a little bit more involved, or a high school student mm-hmm. athlete who is uh, supporting that, that individual to get services and is wondering, do I go with a therapist or do I go with a mental performance consultant? Like, what would be an example besides, you know, their scope of practice, training, education, licensure, and certification? What would be an example of presenting issues that would go towards the clinical side? And then what would be an example that would go more towards the sport performance side? Yeah, I would say kind of where we're observing the, I feel like this is going to be too strong of a word, so I apologize. Where we're observing the disturbance or the issue or the uh-huh. challenge, uh-huh. Uh-huh. say we have a student athlete or have an athlete that's competing in tennis. Okay. And we see... I know why you picked tennis, too, because I know that you've worked with a lot of tennis players. <laughs> I, I do have a bit of a tennis background. You, you got me, Lucy. You got me. I do. <laughs> Prior to directing everybody, you had your own applied you know, practice and, and work. So I had, to, I had to like, I was like, is he going to say tennis? So I, <laughs> yeah, I, had, I, had, I had a life for this role. Yes, yes you did. Really yes, you did. Um, but yeah, if we, if we have a tennis player that maybe between points is expressing a, a lot of anger, frustration, uh-huh. and in ways that are less than desirable or not productive. So whether it's, you know, verbal outbursts or racket abuse or even just the inability to, 
be present for the next point uh-huh. because of what happened in the previous point or the previous uh-huh. game. Uh-huh. Then that's something that I think at first glance, immediately you say, hey, a performance consultant can address that. No problem. Yes. We can talk about routines. We can talk about rituals. We can talk about emotion management, etc. Uh-huh. 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 I think if that same individual is also exhibiting challenges with anger, frustration, and emotion management outside of tennis, or the intensity in which they are showing it in tennis is one that causes for perhaps deeper concern, then that would be where you would start to ask the questions and entertain the notion of perhaps this is something that a subclinical or clinical and that a licensed mental health professional would be better to address than a a performance site consultant. So that's a... Mm -hmm. I, I went to my default tennis, like you said. Yeah, you I, did. That's the example mean, that comes to mind for me. No, um, <laughs> that's great. And I think it kind of can carry over into other sport examples as well. For sure. Um, just the notion of what you see in the midst of the training competition and then where and how are we seeing it perhaps in domains outside of sport. Uh-huh. If there's a theme in kind of those undesirable behaviors or those challenging behaviors, that's where it might be beneficial to start to wonder, hey, we're seeing this across domains. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Is there something that is a little bit deeper, a little bit beyond um, some performance psych interventions to address? Uh-huh. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. And when Dr. Goodson is speaking about domains, he's talking about not just the sporting environment, but in your relationships, in school, mm-hmm. in jobs potentially, but other areas and domains of life. That could be impacted by that set of thinking, emotions, or or behavior. So I appreciate that breakdown. So let's talk about that. You you started practicing as applied practitioner back in the day before ascending to a director, right? Like, yes. let's talk about that. And where does your interest lie in this? How did this all come about? Oh, man, it's, it's a yeah. long story. I'm going <laughs> to give the cliff notes version because we could be here all day. <laughs> There are a couple of things that come to mind for me. So when, whenever I think about my interest in sports, I, I think of three different things. One, a North Carolina native, born and raised in Fayetteville. And okay. uh, my parents bleed Tar Heel Blue. Okay. And so it's okay. very ironic that I work at Duke right now. Maybe but, not, though. Um, Maybe not. You know? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But, but either way, I, I grew up watching these collegiate athletes compete in as a little kid, even though I, I wouldn't say that I knew that this was interest in sports psychology, I always wondered what happened to these people that we were all yelling and cheering so hard for after the TV mm. went off. Like, what happens to these people after, mm. you know, we're in stadiums and yelling for them and people are mm. holding up signs and all this stuff. Like, what do their lives look like outside of this? I think from there, I had a good amount of sport experience growing up. And I'm thankful to my parents for exposing me to a lot of sports. And the two sports that I really stuck with the most were tennis and basketball. Okay. And I think some of my own experiences in that around performance challenges, around like excelling in certain ways at certain times Mm -hmm. and certain things Mm -hmm. also piqued my curiosity. And then particularly when I started my college tennis career, I noticed that there was a a shift kind of in the way I was experiencing the sport and was really curious about, you know, whether this was something that was normal, if there was somebody that I could talk to or, Mm. you know, some way professionally that someone addresses Mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. And that led to me taking an independent study course in sports psychology my sophomore year in college. And Mm. I'd say from there, the rest is history. Yeah. So where'd you go to college? Where'd you play? I went to Davidson College. So oh, okay. I, I walk, yeah, right outside of Charlotte. Most people know. Because Wait, that's where Stephen Curry goes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So yes. I had the fortune of being in school at the same time as Steph and that elite mm. eight run being a student there. And, and that was really cool and really significant. And so, you know, I learned about sports psychology as a profession and I take an independent study course. And the more I learn about it, the more I fall in love with it. And mm-hmm. I think about, you know, the applied interventions I selfishly of course think about it for myself first like how can uh-huh. I kind of help uh-huh. myself be better in these moments sure um, but also learn about the value of being able to help others navigate those moments and also recognizing that what I was seeing in sport in terms of navigating some performance challenges also carried over and lingered on to life outside of sports so I thought about my, my peers and my colleagues who, who played either on my team or on different teams at the time uh-huh. and said you know uh-huh. there's 
There's mm-hmm. an additional component to this that mm-hmm. some performance psych interventions may not fully address or fully meet. And mm-hmm. so it was at that time that I that I recognized, okay, I'm thinking about graduate school in sports or psychology. There's going to be value in me having at least background in in clinical mental health, whether I choose to be a licensed provider or not. Uh-huh. Now, uh-huh. this was me, you know, college Aaron talking. So no idea that we were going to go fully on the pathway that we did. Yeah. But that did influence where I chose to go to school. So I wanted to go somewhere where I knew I'd be able to get training in clinical mental health counseling as well as sport performance psychology. And there are a couple of PhD programs that do that. There are a couple of places that offer master's degrees in both areas. And so that was the pathway I knew I was looking towards. From there, then it gets really interesting. I, I applied a couple of times. That's, that's a, again, a whole different podcast episode to West Virginia University's program. And ultimately was granted admission where I was able to earn a PhD in sport and exercise and performance psychology, a master's in licensed clinical or a master's in clinical mental health counseling, and then a master's in sport and exercise psychology in a five year package. And so I was like, you know, that's that's a little too wait, hold up. So. You've got three degrees in five years. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who can't <laughs> see him right now, he's just like, uh yeah. The expression is like, I can't believe and, I just did that. Yeah. And, and the graduate certificate that works into the whole career journey. That's why I mentioned that. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, gotcha. So I'm in Morgantown. And, you know, as I, as I think about like my statements of purpose and personal statements and things that, that go into the grad school applications, a lot of it was really focused on, you know, I want to learn how to help people perform better. Mm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think on the surface, it seemed extremely performance psych focused and performance psych exclusive. But I also recognize, I think, from my experience as a, a Black person in America, but then also just navigating my upbringing that, you know, hey, if I want to specifically work with Black folks, then sometimes it's not enough to just talk about the performance psych side. Hmm. So I didn't know how far I wanted to go down the clinical route, hmm. but I knew there was a need for, for both, right? Hmm. And not to, to just put it on, you know, my status as a, as a you know, racial or ethnic minority, but that was something that factored into my thought process. Because we think about the cultural makeup and background of athletes that play sport, mm-hmm. right? Like, if you want to be able to meet people where they are, that's something that you absolutely have to consider. And that, you know, influenced me to, to pursue that, that dual training. So I get to Morgantown and... You know, the institution has a, has a great reputation, great opportunities for applied work. And so, like you said, I start going down that route immediately. So, you know, I had the opportunity to work with a couple of varsity teams there. I, I worked a couple of summer internships that were performance psych based, one at a golf academy, one at a tennis academy. And nice. I'm, I'm fully in this, this uh-huh. role, right? And then uh-huh. I get to my, my fourth year and I'm doing my counseling practicum and internship. And that's where this thought of, hey, maybe there's a clinical component that would be beneficial for me to learn comes into play in full force. So I'm working in a college counseling center. I'm getting to see student athletes and I've already been seeing them on the performance side, but then we're learning more about not only am I having these issues in performance, but I'm also trying to navigate life as Uh an 18 to 22 year old. Uh And it was an interesting experience. And I also got to work at a small school just south of WVU for my practicum and internship. And then at the same time, the requirement of the program was to be teaching sports sociology and sports psychology. And I realized how much I enjoyed teaching Mm. and Uh how much I enjoyed research. And so insert the graduate certificate university teaching. Really fortunate that because teaching was a part of our program, we were able to count some of those credits towards the certificate. So I was taking two more courses and I said, I can do that. Plus, I thought that learning more about teaching and pedagogy would help me as a consultant in terms mm. of teaching mm. certain skills, mm-hmm. meeting people where they are and being creative in some of those techniques and approaches. And I don't know if you know this about me. It's actually really funny when I look back at it, but it also makes sense. I decided my last year of grad school that I enjoyed applied work but I had a life as a professor. 
I thought that my research you know, was on the psychosocial development of student athletes, specifically Black student athletes. It tied in the performance enhancement components, but also you know, some of the developmental psych and well-being things. I said, you know, this is my route. There's not a lot of research out there. And I actually, after grad school, my first job was working as an assistant professor at Winston-Salem State University in HBCU. Mm-hmm. And was to Salem, North Carolina in yep. the psychology department. And I'm like, I get to teach sports psychology, but I also get to interact with student athletes and black students and do research in a way that's not represented in our literature. Exactly. And I go, okay, you know what? I am in the spot. Like, this is where I want to be. As I'm there settling in, I'm having a great experience. And I still have this itch to be mm. doing the applied work. Is hmm. what I realized. I think hmm. it was after my my fall semester, after my first semester. Okay. And, you know, of course, I had student athletes in some of my classes, and I talked about my background and had conversations with them. I had met a couple of coaches just casually, and they heard about the background and, said, hey, that's really interesting. And I actually talked with folks in the athletic department trying to figure out how to set up kind of a, a research pipeline and gather data from student athletes. And they heard about my background and said, hey, can you talk to our head coaches about this? <laughs> this yeah. performance? Like, yep. this all sounds really interesting. And so yep. I think all yep. those things combined for me to, to realize, A, how much I missed it, and B, that if I was, even if I was going to continue in academia, that I wanted to, I used this term earlier in the podcast, and if, if I wanted to close the loop. I had a degree uh-huh. in counseling, but uh-huh. did I have a license? No. I take all this coursework to be eligible for CNPC and I had submitted to apply, but like, was I doing any practicing? Not necessarily, but I wanted to be able to do so. Uh Uh And, you know, I share that because about halfway through my spring semester at Winston-Salem State and thinking about this itch and this nudge, we also happened to see one of the booms in jobs in collegiate athletic departments. And so we're seeing these, these posts come out and I'm stuck because I see myself in this place that I can see a pathway. I think can do really good work. And I also see an opportunity to get some great experience going back to doing some of the applied work, being in front of student athletes, teams, coaches. Uh-huh. And I took a chance and applied a couple of places. And you remember meeting uh, Angel Brutus in October yep. as well. Yes. She and I have a great working relationship as students coming through as, but she was at Mississippi State. Uh So I applied there. I actually told her I wasn't going to apply like two or three times. I was like, I'm in North Carolina. I'm at home. (laughs) Yeah. And she was like, cool, no problem. I understand. And, you know, something just changed. And I applied Uh and I went down there for the interview and was fortunate that they offered me the job because I, I didn't look back. So when I got to state, I came in as the assistant director of counseling and sports psychology. And I think one of the things that really maximized my experience and influenced my trajectory was that while they had found ways to provide services to student athletes at Mississippi State, they had not had an embedded department until uh-huh. Angel came. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and so uh-huh. it was not only for me being embedded in providing services to student athletes and teams, it was how do you structure this yeah. administratively in a uh-huh. department and help navigate all of those pieces that I mentioned earlier that are part of the interdisciplinary care team and just general support staff? Uh-huh. And that, I often tell people, single-handedly the, the most important professional experience of my life. And I say that because that is what allowed me to move into this direction of being able to be a director where I actually was able to serve as the assistant athletic director for counseling and sports psychology my last year at Mississippi State. Uh And then in my transition to Duke, I think that is what has helped me be in position and to be seen as someone who could serve as director of mental health and performance. So Uh that was the Cliff Notes version of the story. But Believe it or not. Yeah, believe it or not. I was looking at the clock and I was like, I'm still talking. This is a long, long time. But... All of that is what led to being able to kind of be in this director space. For sure. And it is that combination, not only providing the services, but also knowing how to work within the system, navigate others while still remaining ethical and and providing good quality work to the clients that you serve. So that's, that's the short version of my story and kind of how I got here. 
No, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I think it is so important to hear your story so that others, as they think about how they can be involved in supporting athletes and their mental health and performance, I think is really, really important to be able to see someone and hear someone doing it, the steps you've taken to do it, representing men, representing Black men in the profession is important. And the twists and turns that you took, the acknowledgement of the itches and then responding to that and pivoting and going here and going there. And I think that that's also important that people can change their minds. People can listen, listen to themselves, right? And act accordingly and move Mm -hmm. in that direction. Nothing's permanent. There's, you know, if you follow your heart, if you follow, you know, and identify your purpose, you can't go wrong. And I think Mm -hmm. in your process, you are figuring that out and made decisions. Absolutely. And it's super inspiring and powerful. And I just really thank you for sharing it. Absolutely. No, it definitely, I think everything you said hits the nail on the head. You know, you change your mind. There's a good friend of mine that talks about no decision is permanent. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you experience consequences from changing your mind. However, no decision is permanent. And I think that really helped and has continued to help me as I've weighed different different options and considerations on now this side of my journey Uh and Uh being in an applied role and now even director roles and administrative roles. Totally. And I think, you know, myself as a parent also being able to parent in that way, you know, my eldest being a a student athlete in high school right now, like, girl, you don't like, you can, you don't have to be stuck to that. And then follow it because you said you were going to you get to that doesn't mean you don't keep your word that doesn't mean yes. you're on, you know kind of back and forth in a casual way no it's a checking in it's a process of reflection and building that self-awareness to make that decision and to be able to articulate yes. why you are moving in this other way and i think Absolutely. that's an important lesson for all human beings whether they play sports or not especially those of us brown and black folks who often don't get grace when we when we do those things. So I, yes. I want to make sure we talk about that. The stigma that is universal around talking about athletes in mental health, but there's a deeper stigma in my experience of brown and black individuals, men, women, or or other gender identified individuals around how we can talk about it, how we can support them in talking about it. What have you seen in your work and the work of your colleagues that you oversee are some important points and ways that we can continue to normalize and destigmatize, especially for the brown and black student athlete? Absolutely. I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is with brown and black student athletes, I think also just the dynamic of client and clinician relationship that mm-hmm. we've got to be sure we we often do, but we've got to be sure to stay client centered and recognize how much of an expert these people are are on their own experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that we can have an idea of some of the presenting concerns. We can have an idea of the direction we want to go. I think this is the case with everybody, but I think specifically with our brown and black clients of how much they know and are able to express about their environments or feel about their environments, even if they can't find the words. I think, for example, that there can be individuals that present with concerns that align with anxiety. Uh Uh-huh. And I think without being deliberate, intentional, and curious about the cultural component that can be contributing to those anxiety symptoms, the way that they recognize their environment, how they navigate it, Uh might be different from their peers, even if they can't put words to it, to believe that, to find different ways to allow them to express that. Uh If they can't put it into the most clear words, is there a story? Is there a movie? Is there a character that they resonate with and they resonate with them because they see themselves in them as they navigate their own experience? Uh Again, I think that's an intervention for everybody, but I think the cultural component in thinking about our brown and black 
student athletes, it's extra important. And I think that the notion of, of cultural trust and cultural mistrust and allowing that to be appropriate, that there are some clients that would just prefer to talk to somebody that looks more like them mm-hmm. and that it's not personal. Right. right. And that it's not, you're not good enough or, you know, and I'm speaking now thinking about like colleagues I've worked with and how these conversations have come up and that if someone struggles to articulate that preference or someone's not responsive to reaching out, that's not written off as, oh, they're just not interested. Right. There could be so many other components, as you mentioned, to consider when we talk about normalizing the experience of black and brown folks that they often don't get the benefit of the doubt for. Hmm. And I think it leaves space for us to ask questions about what therapy looks like in a traditional sense and how we're trained to do it and where does it need to be modified appropriately to meet people with these identities where they are, even down to the style of conversation in the room. Right. Where, you know, things don't have to be as structured. If I ask about things a certain way and I get this response, do I assume it means this or do I stay curious and ask them about it? Uh Um, Uh Am I okay Uh with either looking differently or taking a little bit longer to build rapport? Right. Because of what may exist or the history with or whatever it might be. Those are things that come to mind for, for myself, but also for you know, not only the staff that I oversee, but colleagues that are working in the space when we have these conversations about meeting black and brown student athletes and how you may need to make adjustments to the way that you approach, meet, and support them as compared to the the non-black and brown student athletes. Uh-huh. 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 I appreciate it. You're you're making me reflect on another very, very influential and empowering Black female, aside from Dr. Angel Brutus, is Dr. Kenza Gunter. I, I consider Absolutely. her a friend and a mentor. And she and I have had discussions about, you know, a brown and Black practitioner, whether they're a clinician or sport performance consultant, working with the Black and brown student athlete or athlete versus a white identified practitioner working with a black or brown student athlete or athlete, what would be the different considerations between those two? Because you know, and we've talked about earlier here, here, the therapeutic alliance and that relationship is so essential for any progress in any direction to be happening. That sense of trust, relatability is key. How do you think it's different for the white practitioner working with the black and brown student athlete? It's hard to put into words, but a couple of things that come to mind for me are, I think sometimes there's a space between what we're taught and how to interact with Black and Brown individuals and what the space necessitates. Uh And I think sometimes I've seen white clinicians have concern about going away from what was taught or sticking too much to what was taught and not just being another human in the room. Hmm. And recognizing the context of that this person may be bringing in, or will be bringing in, their own set of thoughts and experiences about working with the white clinician. They're going to be bringing Mm -hmm. in their own set of thoughts and experiences about therapy. They're going to be bringing in their own thoughts and experiences about vulnerability and opening up. And that is something that... I have seen black and brown clinicians be able to meet black and brown clients on in a different way. Uh I think it's important to note that that doesn't necessarily mean just because I'm black and have a black client means that we're going to click instantly. That's right. Everyone knows that it's not always the case, right? It doesn't mean that, but I think that's right. I think that's the difference. It is just the notion of there's space to remember what the book says, remember what trainings say. And there's also space to kind of just be a human and free silent in a way that is appropriate, in a way that isn't off-putting. And I think that happens differently for Black and Brown clinicians than white clinicians. Uh 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 I think there's also, when I think about Black and Brown clinicians and different challenges I've seen sometimes, 
I think that's back to what I mentioned earlier about sometimes assumptions, right? Instead of black and brown clinicians being being sure and being careful to not think just because, okay, cool, like you're black, I'm black, or you know, I'm brown, you're brown, cool, we get it, right? We right, right. Understand. Yep. Uh, because yep. even though there is a significant portion of cultural overlap, I've seen missteps happen based on assumptions. Uh-huh. Assumptions from the client, but also assumptions from the clinician. Uh-huh. So that that those are all important things to consider how I've seen them play out and how I've even experienced them in some ways. Uh-huh. No, super valuable. I mean, yeah, I think you were talking with, with Kenza before this or something, because that's exactly what she would say. And what I've learned to sort of internalize and consider. I mean, again, just because you're a black and brown clinician doesn't mean the black and brown student athlete's going to choose you to work with. And I think that's the important part. It's the choice. It's the choice yes. of a student athlete based on whatever. And we don't, mm-hmm. we don't, I mean, we don't need to be concerned about why. If that's mm-hmm. where they feel comfortable, that's where they feel comfortable. If you're going to, you know, do good work with this person over here, not the person I thought, but that's the person you want, then like, let's go do it, you know? Exactly. And have that humanity. And again, too, that white clinicians or uh, practitioners, mental performance consultants could have experiences with brown and black people that inform them around not coming in based on assumptions and stereotypes because they have their own lived or sporting experience as well that brings them into the space in a different way. And I think in the end, it's having these open conversations, right? Like with your student athlete, your client, how does it feel that we share these differences and that we share these similarities and like be able to explore that and fine tune that trust. I think in my experience, when those conversations are brought up and initiated by the clinician, the one who actually has more power in the room, no matter what race or gender, it actually brings a sense of relief and openness that the athlete, student athlete didn't have to be the one bringing it up. Absolutely. And so I think that there's so many ways to go about it, but at the same time, some important things to consider around the history of brown and black folks and mental health and Mm. what they were taught, what they weren't taught, the messages, socioeconomics comes into role. There's so many things, but in your experience and in, in thinking a little bit about the future, where do you think it lies with mental health and sports? What would be a sign of success that we're moving in the right direction when it comes to supporting the well-being of our student athletes and those who serve them, those who yeah. serve them, athletic trainers, coaches, assistant coaches, grad, grad assistants, et cetera, all those other human beings who have a close connection to sports as well, probably, um, that's mm-hmm. why they choose their profession. How do we support the ecosystem, if you will, that supports yes. the student athlete and like my interdisciplinary standpoint, like what, what would be signs of success that we're, that we're on the right path? Gosh, I think, I think that's such a big question. And, and I have a lot of different thoughts. The one that's the most salient for me right now is exactly what you said about like supporting other individuals and the ecosystem. Uh-huh. And you could not have said it better. Student athletes, particularly collegiate student athletes I'm thinking about, enter into the sport experience where they have these time demands and these demands on their body yep. and things of that nature. That's right. And so do the people that support them. So what does support, I think, beyond what we traditionally understand from an EAP model look like for the mental health and wellness of coaches, of support staff? And I think one of the things about being embedded, it's not exclusive to being embedded, is there is that flexibility because schedules change so much and so often to be available in ways and in times that are harder to do so when you're not embedded. And so the next frontier is well, what does that look like for the support staff as well? Mm-hmm. A lot of people in collegiate athletic departments, you know, literally 90% of them are maybe doing consultations with coaches about a student athlete, not necessarily consultations about a coach in their lives themselves, but they're providing services to student athletes. So what does it look like to provide mental health and wellness care to these people, right? Obviously, as you can imagine, there there could be some complications if there's an embedded role in athletics Uh providing mental health services to coaches and support staff. Uh But I think there's a space for us to figure out where can they get this? Yeah. And how can they get this? Because they are operating on 
the same schedule, if not in some ways, an even more stringent schedule uh-huh. in different ways. Uh-huh. And someone that is unwell in that regard, gosh, there's a quote that, that the specifics of it are escaping me, but if a system is unwell, then it's going to be hard to take care of the people that are navigating the system. Yes. And so I, I yes. do think that there's this immediate thing of, okay, what does mental health and wellness care of coaches and support staff look like? That is probably the most immediate frontier. And I think the more that we are able to integrate that into what is continuing to grow for athlete mental health and wellness care, then we'll be going in a good direction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Yes, the complications of clinician, maybe an embedded clinician working with a coach mm-hmm. or support staff. You and I both know in the sports psychology field, the mental sport performance field, that the role of the mental performance consultant, one of the, our biggest clients or areas of importance for us is the coach. Yes. yes, like you said, the primary thing they do is like, oh, I want to talk about how to best support my student athlete, but the vulnerability that it takes, because we know that our role can also help them identify their own individual areas of like what burnout looks like to them and, Mm -hmm. and what skills and tools can you use to help prevent and alleviate that? It's almost like it has to be, if they want their student athletes to get the support, they have to also lean into that. But I think there's a generational piece, a stigma still. That's not what I did when I was an athlete. Like, yeah, it's tougher, right? Like, how do we invite them to be a part of this process, knowing that it's going to help them as people and then help their student athletes? Yeah, I actually think I have a really solid answer for this. Hey, Um, let's go. I'm not surprised. (laughs) one One of my colleagues, one of my friends that I was in graduate school with, Tammy Sheehy, is a professor. I want to say Bridgewater College, but her dissertation was about coaches' utilization of performance enhancement. Mm. And I know there are a number of other people that do research mm. on this right now, so I mm-hmm. forgive me for not knowing their names, but I think mm-hmm. that concept and getting to kind of like see her work and her preparation, her dissertation defense mm-hmm. provides really awesome guidance to invite coaches and staff members, particularly coaches in, by saying, Hey, you want to ask about your student athletes, how they perform? Guess what? Coaching is a high performance activity. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And I think framing it like that to open the door to be able to ask questions in a way similar to what we ask athletes. Like, how do you know when you're coaching well? What does it feel like when you're not? What are your personal indicators? That's right. What do you feel? But also, what do you see? And in couching couching their coaching as a performance can be a way to either start to break down the barriers or get around the barriers because they, they, they want to talk about it. Yeah. And I think a lot of times too, something that I've learned being embedded in different college athletic departments is that we assume that they talk about it because a lot of coaches are friends and their families are connected, but they don't necessarily always have a dedicated space to do so. That's right. Yeah. Right, to talk about their coaching as a performance. And like you said, if you're talking about in front of other coaching colleagues, there's an element of vulnerability that folks may not want to approach. Yes. But I think that's how we can start out providing that support that, hey, coach, sometimes the term mental health and wellness gets people kind of, ugh. Right. You talk about <laughs> your coaching as a performance. That's right. In a high performance. So, how do we help you enhance that performance? And I think that can open the door in a really good I love it. I love it. Yes. And I'm thinking of the other high performers in the ecosystem, referees, Mm -hmm. umpires, athletic directors. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could go on and on. They have to regulate their emotions. They have to have a set of values that they move from. They have to be able to set their own goals and take care of themselves. It's an important, like you said, if the ecosystem isn't well, you know, every component of that ecosystem is not as well as it could be. And so all of us kind of leaning into that is amazing thoughts here. I mean, as I'm feeling it, I hope you are too. We could probably talk for hours about this stuff. Absolutely. I, I was thinking no. the same thing actually <laughs> right now. I was like, I was like man, hey. what do you mean we're wrapping up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe we will one day. I look forward to that and just chatting it up some more about these yes. thoughts, ideas. I mean, 
You are a very inspiring individual. The work that you're doing, just how you show up in the world is just really, really important and has moved me immensely today. So I appreciate just the human that you are and taking the time to speak with me today, hang out, share some laughs, but also talk about some really important issues and topics. So I I really appreciate your time and your, your presence and your attention today. Thank you for your kind words and thank you for the invitation and holding the space. It has been wonderful. And like you said, I'm already thinking about when's the next time we're going to get to chat, whether it's on a podcast or we get to see each other, just catch up. This has been wonderful. And I can't thank you enough for, for having me. Thank you so much. Athlete Mindset is part of the CASORS Podcast Network. At CASORS, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're growing this one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you by searching Kaz Source on your social media app of choice. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network, the Kaz Source Podcast Network. 